Here's the thing, we started out friends. It was cool, but it was all pretend. And yeah, yeah. Oh, there's no backup dancers? Okay. I'm sorry, what was that? Hello, my name is Elena Brahma. I was born with Kids Like Fish. Dedicated, you took the time. Wasn't long until I called you my kind. Yeah, yeah. Since you've been gone. Hi everybody, my name is Stacy. Um, my hobbies include cuticle care and the e-network. And all you'd ever hear me say is how I pictured me with you. That's all you'd ever hear me say. Da, da, da. I guess, I guess what I want. You had your chance to blow it. Out of sight, out of mind. Shut your mouth, I just can't take it. Shut your mouth, I just can't take it. No, 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 no. Performing live gives me such a rush. Due to the incredible amount of growth that we've experienced as a university, sometimes it can be difficult to stay in the loop with everything that's available for you on campus. We created an app to fix that. It's called GCU Engage. Let me show you how it works. Once you open the app and sign in, you'll notice the home page. This page will have a variety of resources that are available to you while navigating throughout the app. At the top of the screen, you'll notice a search tab. Use this to locate anything that you're looking for within the app. To the right of the search tab, you'll notice a profile icon. You can use this to customize anything about your own personal profile. Underneath the profile icon, you'll notice a weather tab. Here you can view the weather for the week. In the middle of the screen, you'll notice a view agenda tab. Click on this to see events that are taking place throughout the week as well as the rest of the semester. At the bottom of the screen, you'll notice a group section. Here you can view groups that you've joined as well as conversations with your peers within those groups. We hope that this will be a resource you will use to stay connected to the things that you want to know. GCU Engage, your pocket guide to campus life. Well, good morning. Let's stand and worship together.
we're in the presence of our King, so let's worship with all of our attention to give Him what He deserves.
to sing alone. Alone in my sorrow, in dead in my sin. And lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, then my life began. Oh, we sing Ash. Ash was and Ash was redeemed. I'm a prisoner no more. And my orphan heart was given over. My morning grew quiet. My feet rose to death. When death was arrested, my life began. Come on, we sing your grace. And oh, your grace, so it washes over me, and you have made me new, now life begins with you, it's your endless love pouring down. my chains, I'm a prisoner, no more, hey, my shame was a ransom, faithful Lord, he came to my death, and he called me his friend, come on, you say, when death was arrested, in my life began, oh, oh your grace, so free, it washes over.
Father, the fact that you would trade everything so that we could know you. God, we're grateful for that. God, let us remember that every moment. God, remind us when we forget. God, we praise you that we're able to worship you and that we have, despite the things that go on in this world, we have the hope of eternity and that nothing else matters and everything else will fade away, but God, you will remain and we will praise you for eternity. Lord, we love you. Thank you that we can worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, Grand Canyon. Hope you had a great weekend, and you're looking forward to a great week. Uh, hopefully you've had a really uh, super start to your semester. Um, many of you have downloaded the GU Engage app. Some 13,000 students have uh, created accounts there. So thank you for doing that. Hopefully you're starting to get some push notices about events and activities that are taking place and you're getting connected and finding things to do around campus beyond your homework. So we, uh, for those of you that haven't got connected, uh, I've got a little bit of advice for you. There is a tab on that, um, uh, that app that you might want to go to. It's um, under the Student Connection Campus tab for GCU Engage and you go there and fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you and help you kind of navigate your way around campus if you're having uh, some challenges here this early part of the semester. So that Engage app will be used in a lot of different ways across the university and I think it'll become a huge um, asset to you as a student and to us as a university to help you have a great university and academic career. Secondly, um, Res Life. For those of you that are RAs, thank you for what you do on our campus. So uh, I made an announcement last week about life groups, and those have already launched and are, are rolling. Um, but our RAs, they host a monthly community gathering in their buildings, on their floors, and they really want to encourage you to be a part of those community gatherings when they take place in your building. So they're looking forward to seeing you there and for you to participate in whatever ways that uh, you, you can. Uh, athletics this week, we have two big uh, matches coming up, uh, one in women's volleyball at 6 p.m. on Thursday here in the arena, and Thursday evening at 7 p.m. is a, a big game against Akron University. Uh, men's soccer is going to be playing them in the stadium, so they'd love for you to come out for that. Our speaker for next Monday is Mia Kane. Mia Kane, yeah, yeah. Uh, many of you know uh, um, Mia's son who works here, and uh, Aaron has been a wonderful addition to the Spiritual Life staff, and his mom's going to be speaking next Monday. I think you'll really enjoy hearing from her. So today is the beginning, or the launch, uh, of the second annual Bioethics Conference here at GCU. Yes. So we have some guests here joining us that are going to be participating in that beginning at 1 p.m., at First Southern Baptist Church right uh, to the east of the campus here or to the arena. And so for those of you that are guests here this morning, welcome to our, our chapel. And for those of you that are interested in going, if you're a student, you, all you need is your GCU ID to participate in that conference. That'll begin at 1 o'clock and go to about 4 o'clock this afternoon over at the church. So we have a very special guest this morning that I want to introduce for, uh, to you. And then after my introduction, we're going to play a video, then she's going to come and speak for us. Johnny Erickson Todd is the founder and CEO of Johnny and Friends International Disability Center and is an international advocate for people with disabilities. The age of 17 in 1967, Johnny suffered a diving accident which left her a quadriplegic in a wheelchair without the use of her hands. After two years of rehabilitation and determination, she emerged with learning how to paint with a brush between her teeth. Her high detail, fine art paintings and prints are sought after and collected. Her best-selling autobiography, Johnny, and the feature film of the same name have been translated into many languages, in introducing her to people around the world where she has helped others in similar situations. She has written over 50 books and is a regular columnist in several magazines. Johnny also served on the National Council on Disability and on the Disability Advisory Committee to the U.S. State Department. 
She has served as Senior Associate for Disability Concerns for the Lusane Committee for World Evangelization. Most currently, Johnny serves on the Young Life Capernaum Board. So before you give her a big, warm welcome from GCU, please turn your attention to the screen for a brief video. For me, it's personal. It began back in 1967. I was 17, athletic. One summer day, I went swimming in the bay with my sister. I swam out to this raft anchored a few yards offshore, took a reckless dive into shallow water. I knew then my life had changed forever. My doctor said, Johnny, you're gonna be paralyzed for the rest of your life without use of your hands, your legs. And I said, God, I can't live like this. I won't live like this. Because I couldn't hold razors or push pills down my throat, I, I knew I couldn't end my life physically, so I was tempted to end my life emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I wanted to just lay in bed, tell my mother to turn off the lights and shut the door. Finally, in the dark behind that closed door, I, I cried out, God, if I can't die, then show me how to live. Thankfully, God put Christian friends in my life who opened the Bible and showed me that God permits what he hates to accomplish that which he loves. He permits awful things like, like paralysis to bring forth Christ in me, the hope of glory. My Christian friends helped me find purpose in that. and I learned to give thanks, even in the little things. And with each bit of obedience, my faith grows, my perspective widens, the world gets bigger, and eventually I wheeled out of that dark bedroom and began to embrace life. I discovered there's a world of other disabled people in dark bedrooms who, like me, need to embrace life and know God. I started writing about this and speaking, and before I knew it, my message gave birth to Johnny and friends. If there are folks languishing in isolation without hope, our team at Johnny and Friends connects them to local churches and resources, providing a Bible and the hope of Christ. If there's a marriage breaking apart due to a child's disability, we'll scholarship them at one of our family retreats. If there's a disabled child in Uganda crawling in the dirt or a grandmother in Guatemala being pushed into a wheelbarrow, our Wheels for the World teams will provide a wheelchair and a Bible in their language. If someone can't reach any further than, than their radio, the Johnny and Friends radio program brings hope right into their home. Our Christian Institute on Disability trains pastors, policymakers, and equips churches. And when it comes to the next generation, our Cause for Life interns roll up their sleeves and they do disability ministry in dark corners of the world. My husband, Ken, and I are joined by an amazing team of Johnny and Friends, whether at our headquarters in Southern California, our area ministry teams around the country, or our network of partners and volunteers all across the globe. Our passion is to see people and special needs families embrace Christ, embrace the circumstances that God puts them in, and embrace life. I was there. I know what it's like. And for me, every face, every life changed, every soul saved is personal. So join me. Do as Christ commands in Luke 14. Go out quickly, find the disabled, and bring them into his fellowship. It'll not only fill God's house, it'll fill your heart. Thank you. And greet my husband as well. Pantana. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. What a great time of worship here at GCU in the chapel this morning. And I want to thank Tim Griffith and Marjana Gilpatrick, and of course, um, all the other friends who are putting together this bioethics conference, at which this is the opening speech. But you know, when it comes to serving and addressing the plight of the elderly, newborns with disabilities, the medically fragile, 
people like me with significant disabling conditions, you can't just address their needs in academic terms. No, no. You've got you've to have a clarion call put out to meet those needs. And I trust that's what my words might do this morning. And me, paralyzed for over 50 years as a quadriplegic, having battled stage three cancer, dealing daily with chronic pain, I think you got a good person speaking to you this morning about meeting those needs. Tim Gilmer mentioned that I paint with a brush between my teeth. And when I broke my neck in that diving accident in July of 1967, I fell into such suicidal despair. This is a drawing that I did in occupational therapy. The occupational therapist said, Johnny, draw something that will express what's going on in your heart. I didn't know what to draw, but just something that looked ghoulish, something that might convey, oh God, I've got to live like this? I've got to do this? How can I? Now, I was a Christian, to be sure, but in the hospital, I would lay awake at night trying to figure out what in the world is God doing? I knew the scriptures. James chapter 1 told me to welcome this trial as a friend. And Romans chapter 5 told me to rejoice in suffering. And Philippians chapter 1 said that it has been granted, it has been given to you to suffer on his behalf. Romans 8, 28, even this somehow would fit into a pattern for good. I couldn't believe it. It was just too much for me. And I had so many questions. I felt like gagging on those verses. Big questions I had, and I was near to throwing in the spiritual towel. But one night in that hospital, when it was dark and all my roommates were asleep and the nurses were on break, I turned my head at around 2 a.m. in the morning on the pillow, looked toward the open door, and I saw silhouetted in that door frame someone standing. This wasn't a nurse. Who was this? This individual got down on its hands and knees and began crawling into our six-bed ward. I almost screamed out in panic until this person crawled up to my bedside, peered through the guardrail, and, oh my goodness, it's my high school girlfriend, Jackie. <laughs> the girl with whom I shared boyfriends and milkshakes and hockey sticks. Jackie, I said, if they find you here, they're going to kick you out of here. Shh, she replied. Stood up, gently went a clunk, clunk, lowered the guardrail to my hospital bed, crawled up into bed next to me, snuggled close, put her hand on my pillow, put her head on my pillow, and she reached out, grabbed my hand. I could not feel it, but when she lifted it in the dark, I could see our arms intertwined together, and she turned her face toward me and softly began to sing, Man of sorrows, what a name for the son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a savior. That night something changed. Something she did touched me like nothing else. And it's odd because that night I did not get answers. But suddenly the, the questions weren't that urgent. You see, God's got his reasons for allowing so much pain and heartache and suffering. And those reasons are good and right and true. But I will be the first to tell you that when your heart is being wrung out like a sponge, an orderly list of the 16 good biblical reasons as to why this is happening, it can sting like salt in a wound. You don't stop the bleeding with answers. Oh yes, there comes a time when people stop asking why with a clenched fist and start asking why with a searching heart. And that's a great time for the Bible's answers. But when the suffering is fresh, answers don't always reach the problem where it hurts, and that's in the gut and in the heart. I think sometimes when a person is suffering and asking why, we're like little children and we're on a bike and we, and, and we race on our bike down the hill and, and we make a quick turn at the right of, at the bottom, but there's gravel on the asphalt, 
that we failed to see, so our bike goes clattering to the road, and we skin and scrape our knee. It's bleeding. Daddy comes running up, and we cry out, Daddy, why? Now, how cruel it would be for that child's daddy to stand over him and say with folded arms, well, son, I'm so glad you asked that question. You see, the reason why it happened is because you did not observe your speed down the hill, and you weren't careful about the trajectory, trajectory of your turn. You didn't observe the gravel on the asphalt. These are all great reasons why. But that's not what the child wants. That child just wants daddy to reach down and pick him up and press him against his breast and say, there, there, sweetheart, it's okay, daddy's here. And the heartfelt plea of most people who are hurting is just for that, for someone to say, I'm with you, I'm here with you, I get it, I resonate. We want assurance, we want fatherly assurance that somehow everything will be okay, that the world is not spinning out of control, that it's not unwinding in nightmarish chaos, that our world is stable. We want God to be daddy, Abba, daddy. God of the Bible. We want, we want him to be at the center of our suffering. What's more, we want to experience his goodness. He must be daddy, warm and kind and compassionate. That's our cry. And so God, the God of the Bible, just like a good daddy, is not quick to give us answers or advice, but he is quick to give us himself. In Psalm 18, he gives himself as the mighty fortress for those who are weak. In Isaiah 54, he becomes the husband to the widow. In Psalm 10, he becomes the father to the orphaned. In Isaiah 62, he becomes the bridegroom to the single parent. In Exodus 50, 15, he becomes the healer to those who are sick. And in Isaiah 9, he becomes the wonderful counselor to the confused and the depressed. Never, ever should we separate the Bible's answers from the God of the Bible. The God, God of the Bible gives us life-changing truth, but it is God's people who give life-changing compassion. People like Jackie, that's what she gave me that night. Compassion, come means with, passion means suffering, with suffering. My girlfriend was with me in my suffering, displaying to me the true heart of Jesus Christ. She helped me see that God gets it, that he resonates and he understands with my experience. G Jackie just did not give me the gospel. That night she became the gospel. She embodied the gospel. She made Jesus real simply by representing my savior, my deliverer in a warm and personal way. Sometimes though, we Christians would rather serve someone like me at a safer distance a more tidy, sterile distance. We stand at a polite arm length and we give help to hurting people as though we are slapping a pint of life-giving truth, blood, truth, on the counter and saying, shoving it that person's way, here, believe this, ingest this, swallow this. It'll do you good. It'll, you'll, make, you'll, you'll feel a whole lot better. God has a different way he wants, to hook, he wants us to hook our veins up to that hurting person who is hemorrhaging human strength and pour into them as though giving a spiritual transfusion, warm, personal, the life-giving love of Jesus Christ. After all, we are representing the hands of Christ when we serve, and those hands carry with them the marks of suffering. They have nail prints, that's why Christian service must always be, as I said, compassionate with suffering. You are with that person in their suffering. To serve alongside someone like me with my disability is to pour out, as Thomas Merton said, pour out love like wine as strong as fire. That's what Jackie was able to do that night, make Jesus real to me. She made him feel like daddy. And others did the same back then. These were friends who participated in my heartbreak. One night, it was about 11 o'clock at night, I grew up in Baltimore, graduated there from high school, and 
So my friends, especially from choir, came by one night to, to like kidnap me away and my mom and dad let them go and these were the days when Camaros did not have seat belts. And there I am in the front seat zooming down Interstate 70. Going downtown they drove me to the Pennsylvania Railway Station on North Avenue. This big monolith of a beautiful railway station, cavernous with marble and travertine floors. It was the perfect place to sing. And so we tumbled out and found a, a, a corner of the railway station. There were only a couple of sailors waiting for a train and a janitor pushing a mop. So we started singing in four-part harmony. Man of sorrows, what a name. All of a sudden, before we got into our third or fourth song, an officious looking guy comes over with a badge and he says, you kids there, you see what it says? It says no loitering. You don't belong here, get out of here. And then he looked at me and said, and you Missy, you put that wheelchair back where you found it right now and get out of here. I said, but sir, it's my wheelchair. Don't give me any lip, put that wheelchair back right now. And I said, but sir, it's my wheelchair. He was so flustered and embarrassed, shoot us out the door. My friends and I, we laughed all the way home. But that night, one of my friends kneeled by my wheelchair and said, Johnny, thank you. What you said spoke volumes to me tonight because you called it my wheelchair. I've never heard you own your suffering before, but thank you for owning it. It sure helps me own mine. This bioethics conference this week will no doubt touch on ethical questions that impact people like me. Physician-assisted suicide, the, the you're better off dead than disabled premise, triaging healthcare, skewing the regulations against those who are catastrophically medically fragile, the edge between choosing life and death, between owning your suffering or not, is so thin, so fragile, but hope comes in the fair of in the form of caring people like you, people who show compassion, people who stand beside those who are suffering, who walk you through the journey and don't abandon you. When I think of people who make God real to me, I think of the women who help me, people who get me up and out of bed. I mean, believe me, these people participate in my suffering. Honestly, after 50 years in a wheelchair, you'd think I'd be used to this. You'd think I'd be a veteran at this. I'm not. Every morning I wake up facing quadriplegia and chronic pain, and I think, oh God, <sighs> put me back to sleep. I can't face this day. I'm so overwhelmed. But Jesus, these people are lifting me out of my wheelchair. They're helping me. They're serving me. They deserve a smile. May I please borrow your smile? I have no resources today, but you do. Give me your hope. Give me your joy. Give me your peace. I have none. I can't do quadriplegia, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So help me, Jesus. And yes, let me tell you something. For those of you who are dealing with disappointment and hurt in your life, that is the biblical way to wake up in the morning. That is the Christian way to wake up in the morning, desperately needing Jesus. And you can help people like me learn how to desperately need Jesus. God's not looking for experts. When it comes to ministry, you just have to see a need and meet it and fill it with compassion. Because when people are hurting, who else is there? Service providers, agencies, bureaucracies do not have it in their DNA to be compassionate. Bureaucracies will never be compassionate. But you, with the heart of Christ, will be compassionate. Christians are the agents of comfort and mercy. And when you reach down and help the least and the last of the brethren, you not only give them the gospel, oh friends, you're becoming the gospel to them. And there is such a need because often, almost always, a person's brokenness does not always get better. It does not always get fixed. It does not always get mended, especially in developing nations. The poverty remains, the psychiatric illness doesn't go away, and paralysis does not heal. But God calls us to venture into people's suffering, even when and especially when their suffering does not get better. People whose suffering drives them to near despair are likely candidates for physician-assisted suicide, but you are the one 
who can make a difference, even in their God-forsaken place, that place of rejection. Your caring service reminds people that even the Lord Jesus, who was the most God-forsaken man who ever lived, even he said to those who suffer, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I am here for you. Jesus said in Luke 14, go out, find the disabled, the lame, the blind, the poor, and bring them in. Do this so that my Father's house might be full. You know, there's not many places where Jesus gets that specific about who he once invited into his kingdom. But of all the people you might overlook in your church or in your fellowship, of all the people you might ignore or pass by or care least about, Jesus says, don't you dare overlook the disabled. Don't you dare overlook the poor or the blind or the lame. Reach out to them, do it, and you will be blessed. Helping them teaches you so much about the Lord Jesus. When I was with my friends in Africa not long ago delivering wheelchairs with our Wheels for the World outreach at Johnny and Friends, an African man who was paralyzed came into our wheelchair distribution. He was dragging his paralyzed legs behind him, and he was walking, as it were, with his hands and using flip-flops to keep calluses from on his hands. But when he saw me, he recognized me, leaned back on his haunches, spread his arms wide, and said, Oh, Johnny, welcome to our country, where God is so much bigger. And he's bigger because we need him more here. Isn't it wonderful to need God more? God always seems bigger to those who need him most. And that African man, I tell you what, people who suffer greater conflict always have something to say to people like me and you who suffer lesser conflict. So find a need and fill it. Fill it, even if it's a big need. Serve with compassion. Practice Christianity with its sleeves rolled up. And if you ever feel like throwing in the towel, if you feel like it's hard, if you'd rather kick it into neutral and cruise until Jesus comes back, don't you dare think about doing that. Don't you dare think about cruising. Christians don't kick it into neutral. It's always press on, strive, move forward, onward and upward, do, serve, commit, pray, live, act. But don't you dare kick it into neutral. Too many despairing, despairing people, too many who are elderly, parents of significantly disabled newborns, too many in developing nations, fragile, medically, medically hurting people. Maybe they feel it's their duty to die, or maybe they feel as though it is their duty to let their child die. But you can give them hope. You can make the difference. So find the need and, and meet it. And how do you get involved? Well. Learn how you can make a difference. Come and serve with us at Johnny and Friends as one of our Cause for Life interns. You saw a couple of the images on the video up there in the intro. Our Cause for Life inter interns do fabulous things, working in special needs departments, in churches. We'll send you to a, one of our family retreats for special needs families where you'll serve at, uh, at a family retreat where it's nothing but five days of hands down, slam dunk, off the charts, over the top, fun and fellowship. We'll send you to a nation like Uganda or to the Dominican Republic where you'll practice Christianity with the sleeves rolled up among those with disabilities. We have many internships which provide hands-on training. We've got classroom instruction, field practice. To be a Cause for Life intern is to learn how to put into practice everything I just talked about. And so please visit the booth as you head out of the arena today and pick up some information about not only serving as a Cause for Life intern, but serving at one of our family retreats. Another way you can help, pray for us. Pray for the thousands, the tens, the hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities that we are trying to reach for Christ around the world. If people don't pray, nothing of any eternal good will happen. Nothing. Oh, perhaps they'll be fed and given a wheelchair Perhaps their life will be made a little more comfortable. But it breaks my heart to think that their suffering will only be a prelude of even worse suffering when they enter a Christless eternity. 
when they enter in eternity without the Lord Jesus. So please pray that God will open hearts, that people will respond to the good news of Jesus when we and our interns give that good news to those with special needs. Another way you can help? Well, like I said, you can pray. You can sign up and serve at one of our family retreats, Wheels to the World outreach trips, as a Cause for Life intern. And you can also help financially support the work of Johnny and Friends. Let me show you a brief video of the kind of difference that you can make. Like I said, this is your chance to get involved by volunteering, praying, and financially giving. So step up to the plate right now, if you would. Get out your smartphone and text to, what is it, bit.ly donate.az. Sounds like a millennial thing to me. Anyway, follow the info on the screen and participate with us financially, whether it's a $5 gift or a $15 gift. And don't forget our booth out in the lobby where you can ask not only about our Cause for Life internships, but about consider serving at our family retreats and Wheels World outreaches. Friends, hook up your spiritual veins to someone who's hurting and infuse within them the love of Jesus. Go where nowhere else is going. Don't, worry, don't go where the kingdom is strongest. You go where it's weakest and you make it strong. Go where the world is bleeding out of control and meet those needs for the sake of Jesus Christ. Go shine the gospel light where the world is at its darkest and loneliness. Do this, and the indisputable favor of God rests on you. God bless you, and thanks for listening. Thank you.